Hello, hello, and welcome to the Illuminating Watches channel. This is the first video under the new name, so called because of my nerdiness for the Casio Illuminator brand, but probably more importantly, to shine a light on some of the fun areas of watchdom that might not otherwise get booked into. I tend to go pretty niche, and what I lack in expertise, I hopefully make up for in enthusiasm. I think this one is gonna be a really good one. I've been totally down the rabbit hole on lip, for the last couple of weeks, so I'm looking to drag you down that rabbit hole with me. Now, Lip is one of the most enjoyable histories I've got my head around, with lots of twists and turns throughout. It's really quite a unique and very French story of war and resilience, social and political upheaval, or affairs, to use the French term, technological innovation, and inspirational creative design, as well as some real characters, all based around the scenery of Besançon in France, which I now really want to visit. I've been hugely relying on a group of sources which I've pillaged deeply for this video, so do check them out if you want to get into them further. These include the classic French-only book by Marie-Pierre Coustin and Daniel Galazzo, uh, the book Retro Watches, Pieter Doensen's History of a Modern Wristwatch, and the Electrification of the Wristwatch, as well as summarised translation of the Lip book by Nick Downs, a great article by Paul Barbagallo in Beyond the Dial, the Lip Museum website, and the French YouTube Le Calibre's video on this same topic, amongst others which are in the notes where relevant. Now I've chosen to start this story with the city of Besançon, birthplace of Victor Hugo who wrote Le Miserable, which, as we will see, will become the capital of watchmaking in France and the home base of brands that you might know of, such as Yema, amongst others. Besançon is close to the border of Switzerland and Geneva, and its dominant feature is the oxbow of the river Doubs. There was heritage in watch and clock making in Besançon before 1793, with some fancy clocks made in the shops of Palliard, La Reche, Geoffroy, Perrault and Perron, and it still has a heavy dose of watchmaking history present today, as we'll see, but after the quartz crisis, it's moved on to some new areas, such as microelectronics, as you'll see on screen with various research labs in the area. The catalyst for it becoming a real centre of watchdom in France was when a whole bunch of Swiss watchmakers from Geneva who'd supported the French Revolution, so remember that this was going on around this time from 1789 to 1794. Apparently this group may have been in trouble in their home country because of their role in the revolution, and, this mo and then because of this, they moved over the border to set up shop in Besançon from around 1793, which was actually encouraged by a favorable decree that encouraged the state of affairs and established the manufacture Francais de Horologie in Besançon. Now, one of the leaders of this was Laurent Megavand, who was married to Marianne Breguet, daughter of Abraham Breguet, who was grandfather of Louis Breguet. I'm sure you know those names. Now, he would bring over a whole boatload of Swiss watchmakers to the city, which resulted in around a thousand watchmakers there by 1795. Now, although these Swiss immigrants very much pump primed the local investment into watches, apparently the locals would start to take over and a lot of those original Swiss folks actually went out of business and returned to Switzerland later on. Now, the Jewish watchmaking community of Besançon famously gifted Napoleon Bonaparte a pocket watch in 1807, so there was a well-established group there. And Emmanuel Lippmann, originally born in Alsace, around a two-hour drive away from Besançon, if I believe Google, he began plying his trade in repairing and selling watches and clocks around the community in Besançon in the 1860s. He would establish the Le Comptoir de Horologie Lipman on 14 Grand Rue in 1867 with a workforce of around 15 people. Now to try and keep France in the game with Switzerland, who they were rapidly falling behind, apparently due to a failure to adopt some of these new technologies, the city actually built an observatory in 1883 or 1884, which would be used to certify watches. Now this was inspired by similar ventures in Geneva and Neuchâtel. Another feather in the horological cap for the city was the astronomical clock, 
which I think looks stunning and I'd love to see this in person. In 1893, Emmanuel would rename the workshop to the Society Anonymy de Horologie Lippmann Frères, which would now include his sons, Ernest and Camille, and 25 staff, with a focus on cylinder escapement pocket watches, invented, I believe, from my other videos from Thomas Tompion and George Graham in England, hurrah, but was, let's admit it, advanced very much by Breguet. Now, Lip's first wristwatch movement, which was calibre 20, with a 20 millimetre diameter, was developed around 1899 and obtained a certification of chronometer status from the observatory, with the factory coming online in 1907, which advanced the scale of production from 2,000 a year to 10,000. Now, Ernest Lippmann apparently was the trigger for Marie Curie and Pierre Curie applying their recently discovered radium-based technology to luminescent dials, which continues my run of references to Marie and Pierre Curie, who also had important roles in the history of lume, more generally, the piezoelectric effect, and folks that studied with them who then went on to develop the electroluminescent backlight technology. Now, during the Great War, Ernest Lippmann would take over the company with Emanuel Lippmann passing in 1914. Now, throughout the Great War, Lipp was involved in making chronometers for the military, but also continued to sell watches based on the 20.3 caliber, like the ones on screen, which would include the option to have the Curie-inspired radium dial. Now, the advertisements were indicative of what Lipp would be known for, which is heavy promotion of their watches, supported by industrial scale. Now, the Great Depression hit the city hard, including Lip, but they held on with their key product developed during this time, which was the T18, which was designed by André Donat, which would be a stalwart of Lip and looked at by watch makers well into the 40s and 50s, both in France, but also internationally, as we'll see. Now, Frederick Lipman, later to be known as Fred Lip from 1938 onwards, joined the company in 1931. Interestingly, he'd spent some time in the US with some of the learning that he had at assembly lines in Harley Davidson of all places, which very much fits with his renegade character, which would form the basis for his dreams of automated factories of the future. One of his bold moves before World War II was actually to supply the USSR with technology that would kickstart the watch industry there for years to come with the third state watch factory being established in Penza in 1935, using the T18 as the basis for their whole industry. Now, it seems likely that the collaboration continued into the 70s, as many of the Polyot models share similar features with lip calibers. Note that Yuri Gagarin himself wore a precursor to the Polyot brand into space. As we'll come back to, Lip was already playing with electricity in the 1930s, and in a collaboration with the Swedish firm Ericsson, yes, the phone people, they would secure multiple patents in this area, although my understanding is that the Scottish uh, Alexander Bain was amongst the first here, if you see my other video on British watch history. Another innovation linked with Lip, although I understand it was actually someone from the watchmaking school of Besançon, Edouard Bellin, in 1930 made what some claim to be the first prototype of a tourbillon in a watch based on a lip ebouchet. And there's evidence in later years of lip playing around with tourbillons in a T18 case. So their watchmaking was no joke. At the beginning of the war, lip started the brand Sapra Lip to make items for the war, including armaments, cockpit clocks, chronographs, chronometers, timers, and fuses. However, due to its location not too far from Germany, it wasn't long until the Germans occupied the region. And in June 1939, Besançon was descended upon by the Wehrmacht. They would be pushed into development of clocks, meters, and gauges for the Luftwaffe under the brands of Young Hans, Fuchs, and Isgus. Remember that Lip the Lippmann family was Jewish, so this was particularly threatening for them. Now, Fred Lipp would base himself out of the family factory in Issenden, which was far away in Free France, and this factory had been set up in 1938 as part of Sapra Lipp, which was the Society pour Application de Proceeds Lipp, and was based in the former Jardin military barracks. 
During their time at this location, Fred Lipp and the team would develop the Caliber I for Isenden 24, which became available in 1941, and these were the only watches made entirely in the free zone of France during the war. They would have to uproot again as German troops advanced, moving into Valence, where they continued to make watches after acquiring an old cartridge factory, and you can see examples where Valence is stated on the dial. During this time, his brothers and cousins relocated to the US, and his father Ernest was stuck in Besançon with the occupying forces, trying to keep watch on the factory. Now in 1942, all of France was then occupied, and Fred had to finally give up on making watches with the team and run into the hills. Now Fred would return to Besançon, which was liberated in September 1944. Unfortunately, Ernest and his wife were killed in 1943, after being captured fleeing Besançon, so Fred would take over the company after taking refuge in the Versailles Mountains. At the end of the war, Charles de Gaulle would famously gift a Lip T-18 to Winston Churchill, which is pretty cool, I think, and I believe they have a, a version of this brand available today, branded as the Churchill. The first call of business for Fred and the team on their return to the factory was to produce the next movement, which would be the R25. A 25 mm caliber, which was conceived during the war by Fred's close colleague, Jean-Georges Laviolette. Although it would take an additional three years to get it into manufacture on their first automated assembly line in 1948, as per Fred's dream of fully owning the A to Z of production, after a lot of effort was put into this infrastructure to develop the watch at scale. Over time, evolutions to this movement would include elements to support shock absorption or anti-shock, as you will see on the dials. The ongoing collaboration with Elgin, which we'll come back to, included use of Elgin's anti-shock technology, being a supposed unbreakable barrel spring known as Elgiloy. Can we claim this as a predecessor to the now much mocked Hublonium? Now, one of the coolest uses of this module was for the mountain explorer Moritz Herzog in his climbing of the 8,000 meter Annapurna wearing the Lip Himalaya watch, which would also use the later R23 module that would take the place of the R25 worn by another mountaineer, Lionel Terre. Another iconic watch I'll squeeze in here from the 50s that used the R23 is the Lip Panoramic watch which was so named because of the glass covering the whole case. Parallel to this excitement in the 1950s is the work of the Lip team on the world's first ever electric watch caliber, as a miniaturization of the original electric clocks we spoke about earlier. I go into this in my video on electric watches, which you can see elsewhere on my channel, but suffice to say that although the Hamilton Ventura was the first commercial release of an electric watch in January 1957, Elgin and Lip were the pioneers in early development of parallel conferences in Chicago and France to announce the R27. Now the R27 was developed by the Lip team with 15 engineers with plenty of know-how coming from the excursions to Elgin in the US. The prototype was working in 1952 with John Shannon of Elgin and Fred Lip announcing this in March 1952 to much fanfare with a model being presented by Fred Lip to Charles de Gaulle himself. Now they wouldn't get into production until 1958 due to problems with large production costs and technical challenges with the batteries. This period was super top secret and under wraps um, with secret labs and military links. And you can see an interview with Fred Lip talking through the amount of fire that he was getting from the Swiss watch industry for his investment in this area. The excellent video from Le Caliber which you should watch, has a 1982 interview that actually has English subtitles, which is an enjoyable insight into the character of Le Fred, as he was known, with some fun and appropriate swearing. Some little asides here can help give a flavour of the entrepreneurial spirit of Fred Lip. In 1959, a deal was done to establish Lip Genève, the first foreign brand permitted to do so, making higher-end watches with Swiss movements, Fred also did deals with the likes of Blancpain to sell their watches within Lip's distribution network, 
importantly, it included lip on the dial face. Similar deals were done with companies like Breitling and Universal Jeunet. Fred was also a motorsports enthusiast. I believe this is his Ferrari on the screen if the article isn't telling lies. And Google does show that his name was very much linked uh, to various serious cars over the years. I believe he may have even had a world speed record at one point. This racing link can be seen in this Paul Newman-esque chronograph of the period using Valju movements and Singer dials. Now Singer was the Swiss dial manufacturer that was behind the design of the Rolex Daytona and other brands like the Volcan. I think that's pretty cool. One of the lip brands targeted towards the affordable end of the market was the Dauphine, so named after the Renault economy car of the same name, which is a brand that's still made available today as a homage to the original. Another icon was the Nautic Ski Electronic. Now you might think that nautical and skiing is a very strange clash of terms. It's so named because of Lip's role alongside Omega and Longines as the official timekeeper in the Grenoble Winter Olympic Games in 1968, building on prior promotions of the Tour de France, which you'd also later promote, as well as being a diving watch. The enterprising Fred was quick to exploit the opportunity to promote and launch this watch, making deals with the French ski team for them to wear the watch, with the winner of the giant slalom gold medal wearing a Nordic ski on the podium. Pretty cool watch that you can get versions of today under the current management. In the race for quartz development, Lip was also a pioneer as they commissioned Setathor starting in 1970 to develop the module plaquette electronique, which would be integrated into the R032 Isochron and R033 Exochron calibers in 1973 and 1975 respectively. During the 1960s, Fred Lip achieved his dream of the ultimate factory in Polenta, which was a short journey from Besançon. Indicative of the character of Le Fred, there was a large fresco that included all sorts of references to the horological uh, history, going all the way back to Galileo, with him pictured front and centre, which was much leveraged as a symbol during the long periods of industrial action later as him being this out-of-control capitalist. This factory was also the basis for building products for national defence and the military, for France and NATO during the Algerian War, and the Atomic Energy Commission also received products from this factory. Now, France would start losing out to competitors in the late 60s, such as Switzerland and the US, which meant the demand was just not going to be there that warranted this factory and Lips started getting into some serious financial trouble. The Swiss group Ebersche SA acquired 33% of Lip in 1968 and would secure the majority of seats on the board of directors. In 1971, Fred Lip is encouraged out the door with this triggering a redundancy plan which would activate one of the most notable strikes in history, and I'm not underplaying this, it would go on until 1983 and would include periods of occupation by the workers that continues to be studied today in labour relations courses. You could do a whole video or book on this, and indeed Donald Reed has in the book that you can see on screen now. There was a spat with the company Kelton, who was set up in 1971 in Besançon and was owned by the US-based Timex selling watches in newsagents, tobacconists, department stores and the like, which by all accounts really annoyed Fred who saw them as trash products. However, this did spur efforts such as the mini lip designed for children so that they could learn to tell the time, which was also sold in department stores, and the plastic cased Calypsos, amongst the first alongside Tissot to explore synthetic materials before we get to the Swatch era. Claude Neshvander took over the company in 1971 from Fred Lip during this strike period under the banner CEH Lip, which indicated its Swiss owners, with a focus on bringing designers in to really shake things up. Although to be fair to Fred Lip, things had been going in that direction anyway. For example, 
You can see some quite asymmetrical designs in those prior watches. The most notable one here is the very theatrical Bashmakov Jump Hour, which was actually designed by Minor Royalty, uh, which was Prince Francois de Bashmakov. Now he was a designer and very much not uh, a watch guy. He came to Fred Lip's attention uh, after approaching him directly and also made this very fun packaging uh, which the watch would ultimately come in. So a good indication of the direction the Lip would later go under. The first designer after the Fred Lip era, which was pioneering a new direction for the company, was Rudy Mayer, a Swiss graphics design teacher whose stock and trade was attractive posters and typography. The two main categories of design that Rudy Mayer contributed were the Galaxy line, as well as this square electronic line, which are very sought after today. Isabel Hebe was famous for her work with Concorde, designing their interior design for the planes, as well as the Honda Accord, as well as being an interior designer for many celebrities and fashion stores like Yves Saint Laurent. Her designs you can see here, which built off the design direction that Lip had already been going in with eight different models that she contributed to. One of the most fun designers was Michelle Boyer, who made 18 different plastic cased watches known as Le Candide, with a T13 movement preempting the likes of Swatch, plus two different metal cased watches. I particularly like this yellow and white one, which is the front cover for one of my favourite watch books. Boyer also designed for Renault, which seems to be a theme across these lip designers. Mark Held also contributed some slightly more subdued designs, but this one with the words written out, which is the lip skipper, I think is a particularly iconic one. He also worked for Renault concept cars, which included the Meridienne, which was the forerunner to the more popular Espace, as well as furniture and interior design. Michael Kinn, from an architectural background, would also provide two watches. But probably the most famous lip model, and the one I'd suggest that you've probably heard of, was designed by Roger Talon. Very famous for designing the TGV uh, train system, the Atlantic bullet train, amongst many other things, with the original version having a Valjoux 7734. There's a whole load of offshoots of this model, including later digital models, and this use of super designers for watches no doubt inspired collaborations such as the one between Seiko and Giugiaro, with these watches being amongst my favourites of all time. A model which sits outside of these big name designers but was still cool was the Lip Secteur series launched in 1972 with three different case shapes which had these super cool fuel gauge like displays. The final liquidation of the original Lip is in 1977 who despite all of these design enterprises, um, the industrial action and the competitive dynamics in the market with the quartz crisis meant that they went out of business. The brand would be revived in 1990 by JC Sensomat through more of a mail order format and a transition of production over to Hong Kong. In 2014, Philip Berard would bring some meaningful presence and production back to Besançon, where they continue to focus on historical lines with quartz and some Seiko movements with Jean-Luc Bernard taking over in 2016. They do do some cool watches, uh, primarily Miyota movements, but the occasional automatic, largely based around their historical catalogue. And that's it for this video on lip watches, and what I hope you agree is a pretty unique and interesting history that also includes some pretty cool watches. If you enjoyed the video, please do consider pressing the subscribe button and giving a like with some comments on your thoughts on the video and the topic, it makes a real difference for a very tiny channel like mine. You can also follow me over on Instagram at Illuminating Watches, renamed recently from Watch Reactions, and I hope that you have a great rest of your day.